Welcome everyone, thanks for tuning in today. Today we're going to be talking about the SEAT classification for venous disease. It's fair to say, I'm here with Dr. Peter Paraskevis as well, I'm Dr. Lucy McKinnon. Um, right. It's fair to say venous disease is pretty complex. It is. Yes. It is, yeah. But we do have a um, way of uh, defining venous disease and classifying venous disease, and that's called the CAP classification. So I thought right. we might start today just talking about CAP and what CAP is. So it, it's an acronym, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So clinical, etiology, anatomy, physiology, right? So we're really only interested in the C part of the CAP. Yep. Which is the clinical. Do you mean as clinicians? As clinicians. Yeah, okay. And as patients, I think. Yeah. It's important that we understand what the clinical classification of your vein disease is. Mm -hmm. um, it's important that we know what it is because it's a way of us communicating about someone's condition. Yes. Yeah. But I think it's also probably important that patients know what it is too. So it's an internationally recognised classification system. It gives us an ability to speak at conferences and I think it's fair to say that most papers that we would read use yep. the CAP classification as yeah. well. Yeah. There are other classifications that, that we use. There's um, some scoring systems that, that we can use, but I think the CAP classification is probably the most durable and easier to understand. Yeah. Um, and so there's an advanced classification and a basic classification. I think the basic one's probably the easiest to use. Mm -hmm. So um, so I guess uh, for the average person, just knowing the actual numbers is a beginning. Yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah, I use it. So I think I use it a fair bit when I see patients. I think it's a good tool to be able to, for people to visually see where they are on the spectrum of venous disease. Mm. So um, when they're starting to hit sort of C4s, even C3s, the, the time yeah. critical imperative to actually treat their disease yeah. just gives them a visual analogue for it. We'll pop it on the screen now if you like. We'll, we'll just get yeah, that to see our okay. classification on the screen and you'll see that uh, we start from zero, which is no varicose veins. Mm -hmm. No spider veins, no nothing really. Yep. And it's a good thing if you're zero. I, I don't know why you'd be. Well, we aim to get people zero. to a zero, don't we? We do get people who are zero <laughs> coming in. Oh zero. yeah. Oh, doc, I've got some veins. It's like, <laughs> no, you don't. So zero is the starting point, and then the last classification, the the one that you don't want to be in, and uh, that's CAP six, mm. which refers to ulceration. Yep. So what, what I think we should do is go through each one, one step at a time. Yep. Um and. Just briefly discuss what it in, what each one involves, and yeah. and see if we can actually uh, show some images of each one as well, and then and, and give people a better understanding. So I think the best thing that uh, you could take out of today's um, uh, discussion is where you'd probably be sitting in terms of your CAP classification, and that'll give you a bit more. That'll empower you, and it'll give you the knowledge that you require to take that first step. I think we've moved a lot in medicine over the last even 10 years with uh, the internet uh, where patients actually actively go out and uh, try and self-diagnose, mm. which is kind of not a good thing altogether, but it's a great thing if patients actually do have the ability to um, take some ownership of their condition. And, mm. and so um, I think with the CAP classification, if you know where you kind of sit, then you can actually go to your doctor and say, look, I, I really think that uh, I'm a bit worried about this and uh, uh, what do I have to do? What, what, what are the next steps involved in getting my mainstream? As opposed to in the past where patients had no idea and mm. just turn up to their doctors with absolutely no uh, idea of where they're at, mm. what the condition is, even if they did have varicose veins or not. So. Yeah. On that point, I think it's really important to educate patients. So we yeah. spend a bit of time educating patients when they come in yeah. about why they've got what they've got and why we're treating what we treat yep. and what's involved. But I think it's also really good for referring doctors to know about the CAP classification. So when we're sending letters back to you, you've got a bit of an understanding of what we're talking about as well. Sure. Yeah. All right, so let's let's start with CAP1. Mm -hmm. So did you want to start yep. CAP1, the so easiest? CAP1 is the easiest. No, it's C0 is C0 the easiest. The easiest. So CAP1 is spider veins and blue feeder veins, so reticular veins. So this is, we see a fair bit of this, they're cosmetically concerning veins and um, it's our job really to assess whether there's any underlying deep venous diseases which is actually causing the C1 disease. Mm. Yeah, so the, the biggest, uh, the most important factor here is understanding that when we refer to vein, venous disease, we're talking about a disease. So in my view, no presentation is cosmetic. Mm. There's an underlying cause for every issue. So that's why CF1 is on the scale. 
okay, you've got CF1, it's cosmetic. No, no, it's not. There's something feeding it. And uh, I get patients, many, many patients are coming who've got symptoms, mm. whether it's itchiness along some of these yeah, superficial right. veins or whether Even there's heaviness. a bit of tightness and heaviness. Yeah. And, uh, and lo and behold, there's something actually underneath it. So uh, spider veins, uh, reticular veins, very important. We, we've moved away from calling them reticular veins, haven't we, over the last few years? Feeder veins. Feeder veins, yeah. yeah. So that's an important distinction. Uh, reticular veins are the normal blue veins that you see um, on the skin, particularly when you get cold. You may see this hexagonal kind of appearance along the skin. Mm. We may even put a picture of that up. Or That's if you've quite got see-through skin like me. <laughs> yeah. So, so the superficial reticular veins form this reticulate pattern, and it gives you that appearance. So we're talking about feeders, and you'll almost certainly with spider veins see a group of spider veins and some blue veins feeding into it. And so when we treat these veins, we make mm. sure that we get the feeders first. We need to get the feeders. Yeah. Yep. So um, CF2. Two. two is varicose veins. So these are the big knobbly veins that you can see that are bulging. Um, mm. They're much more obvious to people, I think, and yep. um, can cause some significant symptoms too. Yeah. And so I guess varicose veins comes in, come in all shapes and sizes. Yep. So they could be really lumpy, knotty you know, networks, or they could just be one little straight blue vein that's a little bit bulgy. So it's important to make the distinction between CF1 and CF2. Mm. So uh, one more one more classification before we get to the nasty bit. So, mm -hmm. but this one's an important one, CF3. Yes, edema. So CF3 is swelling. So this is swelling that we can see when we're physically examining a patient, or it might be swelling that a patient is feeling, and we may not even see it on the day. Mm. Um, swelling is where the venous disease is progressing and the circulation in your legs is becoming more, you know, I guess a little bit more um, significantly Condition. impaired. Yeah. We started, we kind of started moving the discussion about veins to not just talking about the venous system, but referring to the lymphatic system. Yep. So the veno-lymphatic system. Mm. Uh, we now know that veins and, and uh, lymphatics are very closely associated. So if there's a load on the venous system and there's pooling of blood inside your veins, your varicose veins, it'll affect the way that your lymphatic movement occurs. And so swelling and lymphatic swelling is very common. Mm. Uh, and patients often don't even realise they have it. In fact, I had a patient the other day who came through and said, oh, well, I don't have any symptoms. And I said, have a close look at your left leg. There's swelling there. Mm. And lo and behold, you know, you poke your finger there and you'll see a little dent. So it's very important to recognise swelling because it is the precursor to the next stage, which um, is a serious stage. Mm. And it tends to kind of, uh, if you get to this next stage, it tends to snowball from there, doesn't it? Yeah, it's kind of, there's a more so a time critical um urgency yeah. to, to, to initiate treatment yeah. but the good thing about c3 is that with treatment of the veins we can reverse it as well so the swelling can go yeah. away yeah. which looks better and feels better in legs too we'll, we'll have uh, we'll have a lot of opportunity to discuss each of these um, areas in future yep. in future um, blogs with so c4 do you tell us about c4 well c4 um uh, it's a broad category so there's a 4a and a 4b mm -hmm. And the 4A kind of refers to skin changes, which are, I would say, reversible mm. to an extent mm. and not as severe. And then 4B refers to the more severe skin changes, which are often permanent in terms of the, the disfigurement that's created. Yeah. So 4A would refer to... 4A is venous eczema, so dermatitis and pigmentation. So it uh, looks a little bit like bruising. Bruising, yeah. Yep. Discoloration. Pretty a horrible thing when you see it and very concerning for patients. Mm. It's probably the one that gets, um, oh, we'll put this diplomatically, uh, confused a lot um, in primary practice uh, because often when the patients do present, pre present with uh, dermatitis and eczema, uh, dermatitis, eczema and pigmentation, mm. um, they often get sort of shunted off to a dermatologist without understanding, hang on, this, this, the reason this is happening is because there's actually a varicose vein causing this. Yep. So that's 4A, and 4B will refer to uh, lipodermatosclerosis, mm -hmm. yep. which if you divide that word, lipodermato, so fat, skin, sclerosis, 
And we spoke about this in our first video on sclerotherapy thickening. and sclerosant. So sclero, which means hardening or thickening. Mm -hmm. So it's a hardening of the skin and the fatty tissue, and that's what lipodermatous sclerosis is. So you often get this disfigurement around the ankle where there's a tightening and a thickening and a change in the diameter. Uh, and we used to call it the inverted champagne, champagne bottle. Champagne bottle, yeah, which we uh, did for the French people out there, or the non-French. <laughs> Not mine. Um, <laughs> Inverted champagne bottle, so you yes. just turn it upside down. Yep, yep. That would be too good. Empty. Empty it out. Um, so the, on lipodermatosclerosis, yes. so I work as an emergency doctor as well, and I think it's probably the acute phase of it can be misdiagnosed a fair bit, I would say. So I see people with a diagnosis of bilateral leg cellulitis not responding to antibiotics in an emergency department setting. You've probably yeah. seen this yeah. as well. Yes. I think we've all seen patients like yes. this. And... Um, when you look harder, you can see, in fact, that this is an acute phase of venous disease yeah. and antibiotics aren't going to do anything. So that's worth considering any doctors out there looking at this at the moment to look up lipodermatosclerosis in the acute phase, otherwise known as paniculitis. Paniculitis, yeah. Um, so chronic paniculitis. Chronic paniculitis, which is a fairly down the spectrum of chronic venous disease. Mm. Okay, acute paniculitis is an acute form of that, is the one that yep. is confusing in, in emergency. And you often see this patient who does present with that acute, thick and red area. Mm. Uh, and many, many doctors would say antibiotics, which is kind of a safe thing to do. Yeah. And that's okay, but yeah. at the end of the day, you've got to understand, hang on, this is actually, uh, it's not just cellulitis here, this is something else happening. Mm. So, yeah, so that's an important point. So I guess clinicians watching this today, if you see someone with a leg that you think might be cellulitis, specifically if it's bilateral, is always consider could this be venous disease? Am I missing, you know, am I missing an acute phase of venous disease? Absolutely. Um, before we move off 4B, mm. we've got one really com complicated and complex condition called atrophy blanche, which, uh, or atrophy blanche, and that's uh, little necrotic ulcers that tend to heal and leave these porcelain white scars. And I see a lot of it. Mm. But again, it's one of those things that if you're not actually trained in the in the diagnosis of uh, venous disease, you probably wouldn't think of. Um, and of course, uh, there are differential diagnoses for these, including mm -hmm. a lot of connective tissue disorders. But yep. essentially, that, that rounds off the, the classification of four, which leaves us with five and six. Mm -hmm. and we can normally group these together. Mm. So five is a healed ulcer, which you can often see there's often scarring, yep. often on the medial side of the leg or the inside of the leg. And six is... An active ulcer. Active ulcer, which is what we don't want to have happen. But we see a lot of. We do, unfortunately. Probably the most rewarding thing to treat, though, isn't it? Yeah. Rewarding but stressful because mm. you've got a patient who's usually quite a little bit older and there are other comorbidities or some other um, medical conditions there. And um, you just want to heal that ulcer for them. You want to fix the problem. You mm. want to get that ulcer healed. Uh, but it just needs a lot of attention to detail and a lot of tippy toeing around it. So we tend to just again as a as a rough guide because I don't really want to get into it today. But um, dressings are important. Mm -hmm. um, stockings are important. Mm -hmm. Fixing the underlying problems is important. Yeah. I've found that hyperbaric oxygen has been fantastic mm -hmm. in helping that healing process. Yep. Antibiotics sometimes, cortisone sometimes. Is it? There, there's a mixture of things that we do, but it's, it is the end stage, and we don't want, really want to have patients have to endure such a, a horrific complication. Mm. And also has potential differential diagnoses as well. Oh, yes. So ulcers on the legs have lots of potential causes, but yes. we're talking about the venous. Venus. The we might, we might uh, talk about that at a future blog. We can. If you've got any suggestions of what you want us to talk about with yes, venous absolutely. disease, feel free. I'm happy we yeah. uh, went through that because it's one of the um, most important uh, initial sort of educational things that mm. we need to get out to patients and doctors. Yeah. Um, was there anything else you wanted to... No, I think that's Adam's. probably, I'd say that's probably about it. Right. Yeah. So feel free to check in again, stick with us. We've got a lot more educational vlogs coming. And if you want to contact us or ask us any questions, just visit our website at... Vainhealth.com.au. <laughs> well done. Thanks, Thanks for joining us today. Bye.